alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to speak to you today about one of the great heroes of Islam and the Muslim world, perhaps of all time, is uh, Salah al-Din Ayyubi or Saladin, as he's known in the West, Western literature. Uh, when I, I came across the name Saladin uh, back in early 1990s when I was still going to university and doing scripture classes in Arthur Phillips High School, one of my students at that time uh, asked me a question that her teacher asked her. And she said, uh, what is Kaaba, uh, who is Aisha, and who is Saladin? Now I know Kaaba, I knew about Aisha, but I didn't know at that time about Saladin. And to my ignorance, uh, I was still in university years. And that really made me curious to search more about and read about Saladin at the time. Um, the second time I came across the name Saladin was in the lectures of uh, Imam Fatullah Gulen, when in one time he's talking about how resolute we should become as people of serving religion and Islam, uh, like Salah ad -Din was in his time. And he gave the example of Saladin when he did not have any tent, or he lived in a tent. He did not live in palaces. Uh, he was so fixated on the conquest of Jerusalem, conquering it back from the Crusaders, uh, that he would live in a tent. And he swore that he would not sleep in a house until he would achieve that. And, that, uh, and he wouldn't smile as well. And one day, one of the Imams uh, giving a Friday khutbah with Saladin in the congregation, he, gave, he talked about the virtues of smiling. And, uh, and when he was going through the crowd the congregation to go to the, uh, lead the prayer, the Saladin grabs him by the robe and says, uh, Imam, I know you said it to me. This all the khutbah was delivered to me, but how can I smile when Jerusalem is under uh, uh, the Crusader hands? So uh, this type of depictions of Saladin is very famous and in the speakers and thinkers of the modern times, Saladin became a hero and a symbol of resisting uh, overpowering forces, achieving unity within Muslims and being resolute in, in the aim to, to defend Islam. So if Islam was under threat, you had to become like Saladin. By the same token, uh, Salah ad-Din is also very famous in the uh, Western literature, very strangely so. Um, he is uh, recorded as a magnanimous and generous knight, knight like a Christian knight almost. But obviously he's a Muslim, and in a way, the Christian thinking in the medieval eras were uh, Christians will prevail, God will help us in the end. But since Salah had been prevailed in the end, therefore it was because of our sins. We were not good Christians, so therefore God punished us through Salah ad din And in a way, Salah ad din became the archetype of a good knight magnanimous, chivalrous, generous, uh, you know, forgiving in, um, in uh, victory and so on. So in a way, he comes, he's one of those unique figures who is a hero both for Muslims and also Christians. I did a, a simple research on World Cat, which is a website that has the repository of the world catalog of all the books. Just put, type the name Saladin. There were 9,984 returns, books, with Saladin in its title. It's a massive uh, literature there just on Salah ad -Din. I only saw one book uh, written by a Muslim, though. I mean, Muslims are, yeah, there is some literature about Salah ad -Din, but not in the modern critical sense. Uh, I ordered that book, it's still on its way. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, it was published in 2008, um, and hopefully when I get it, I'll read it, see if there's any difference between how Muslim or writers depict him and how the Western writers have been depicting. 
Um, the word Salah or Salahuddin, uh, the name is a, a descriptive epithet. It's kind of a laqab, as we say it in Arabic. Uh, it's kind of a nickname. And it was very common in those times for rulers or emirs to have names like that. Uh, Asaduddin, um, uh, you know, Nasruddin, uh, Salahuddin, all these names finish with a din, which means religion. And Salahuddin, by the way, means felicity of religion or righteousness of religion. And there were other names finished with uh, uh, Allah and at the end, like Al Aziz Billah, Al Hakim Bil Amrullah, you know, uh, Al Muntasir Billah. Actually, there's a bit of a joke about this as well. Uh, when Timur, who's a, a Mongol, rule, Mongol Turkic ruler who appeared in uh, the late 14th century and, and delivered a big blow to Ottomans in that, at that time in 1402 and he dies later, a few years later. He was very good, well, very famous and successful fighter and warlord, but he was a bit rough and, uh, and sometimes persecuted people as well. Uh, so he goes to Nasreddin, Hoja Nasreddin, and he says, uh, Hoja Nasreddin, uh, uh, all these great rulers have these, you know, uh, wonderful epithets, uh, you know, Al Aziz Billah, Al uh, Mantusur Billah. What do you think I should have? What kind of a name I should have? He says, Nauza Billah, <laughs> <laughs> which means, which is a kind of, which means I seek refuge in God from you, <laughs> kind of a name. Um, uh, so uh, I just want to say that although Salah was without doubt was a great leader and an example to current leaders, we should have a proper appreciation of leadership. Now good leaders are essential in order to have law and order and success for the, for the nations, for masses of people. Uh, but the thing is, in our Islamic theology, everything good that happens to us, it comes from God. And everything that bad happens to us, it's from ourselves. Because if we apply this principle, uh, if a good leader succeeds, it's from God. If he fails, it's his fault. The reason is that uh, to, to really succeed, uh, leadership is just one ingredient of everything that you have to have, you know, you have to have the nations behind you and armies or civil servants and, you know, the whole raft of people have to work together to produce success. It's a bit like uh, if you have a man whose job is only to turn on a, wa a water valve that irrigates a garden, if he does his job, the garden uh, is irrigated and you get a harvest, but hundreds of others are working as well on that. He cannot take ownership of the, the, the resultant harvest. But if he fails to do his job, then no irrigation, the whole you know, garden will, will go to waste. So he is responsible for the destruction. So leadership position is like that. It's a bit of a curse. Uh, but at the same time, it's glorious. Uh, when you get a good leader, people really uh, acclaim that leader and, and follow him or her. Uh, uh, you, we have to be gender neutral. Um, uh, I just want to mention that like, you cannot really, uh, re this is theologically, you cannot attribute everything to Salah ad But definitely he was an exceptional ruler and, uh, and he did, he was able to unite a large geography of people. And, and then channel that energy against, at that time, the enemy, uh, the Crusaders. Uh, just a bit of a historical context before we go to the rise of Salah ad -Din. You know, in his time, or in the time of his birth, uh, the Muslim world was really divided. Divided in a sense that the Abbasid, central Abbasid rule uh, really collapsed. You still had the Caliph, uh, but there were local rulers, uh, strong sultans, emirs, here and there, were really running uh, the geographies. And, uh, and at that time, uh, still they had to have legitimacy, so the caliph had to acknowledge them as rulers for that geography. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, and that was the Abbasid Caliph was centered in Baghdad, which is the current day uh, Iraq. And then you had the uh, Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt, Cairo. And Fatimids were Ismaili Shiite. And uh, I gather we covered this in previous lectures a little bit. Uh, although they were Ismaili, they were not really, um, uh, they, they were tolerant, you know, the population was largely Sunni. Uh, and by the way, uh, as Al Asar University was established by uh, the Fatimids in uh, 970. Uh, and now it's, it's a very important institution for the Sunni world. Uh, actually, it controls about 5,000 schools as well, in addition to the university in, in Egypt. And uh, so it's, it's the oldest surviving university in the, in the world. Um, but there is another side to the Ismaili, or maybe another sect within that, uh, an offshoot, it's called the Assassins. And they were the violent ones. They, they, they uh, terrorized people, rulers especially, and they sent assassins to kill them. And that's where the word assassin comes from, really, from the, the, them. Um, so that was the kind of a, uh, the time. Uh, the Fatimids were based on Egypt. Uh, and Syria was a bit of a, uh, a ground in which both Abbasid and Fatimids struggled between them. And in the, uh, taking advantage of this weakness in Syria, uh, the first crusade was, was launched in 1096. And it was phenomenally successful, the first crusade. It was led by not kings, but lesser aristocrats, princes, uh, and with an army of 30,000. And eventually, when it came to Jerusalem, they conquered uh, Antioch or uh, uh, yeah, Antioch at that time, the city, very important center, and then came down with 15,000 people, captured Jerusalem in 1099. That sent shockwaves across the Muslim world, uh, as the historian Ali ibn al-Athir uh, notes, the sultans did not agree amongst themselves. It was for this reason that the Frangh were able to seize control. You know, the, the crusaders were called Frangh or Franks. Uh, it's a concoction of that word. Um, and the Crusaders uh, established satellite states, and the chief amongst them were, was the Kingdom of Jerusalem. It's a bit like, you know, just picture in your mind uh, Israel, Lebanon, that strip all the way to Turkey, controlled by Crusaders. And uh, on almost like present day, Israel was the kingdom of Jerusalem at that time. Now, uh, so Muslims were caught by surprise. They were not organized. Uh, the the, this, the ruler, local rulers basically were city-states. They could not agree amongst themselves to defend against the Crusaders. And Jerusalem was lost. The first notable um, resistance came from Zengi. Now, Zengi <coughs> was a Turkish ruler from Mosul, uh, and, uh, and, and he, he also captured Aleppo. And he captured in the, the town of Edessa, which was controlled by Crusaders in 1144. Edessa is the present day Urfa in Turkey. I mean, if, if you're Turkish, you would know where that is, just, just north of Syria. Um, and that was a a uh, massive uh, blow to cr uh, Crusaders. They were shocked. And that actually raised the Second Crusade. And this time it was led by King of France and the King of Germany. They all joined in. They were going to get back Edessa, but it failed. Uh, Zengi and others, especially the Seljuks in Anatolia, present-day Turkey, successfully resisted the Second Crusades. Now, uh, uh, the, we also need to mention the ethnic makeup of this area, especially Syria. Uh, naturally, there were Arabs, but there were also Kurds and the Turks. Um, and this is the time era of Seljuks or Seljuk dynasty, which were the Turkish, uh, old Turkish dynasty, which came from Central Asia, uh, and uh, and they got the approval of the caliph, 
and they ruled over a large geography, uh, northern Iraq and Syria including. So the most of the rulers in Syria were Turkish origin. By the way, Salah din his family is Kurdish. And, uh, but, uh, but he had in his army people from you know, Arabic background, Turkish background, and, and Kurdish background. In those times, although ethnicity was important, religion was more uh, important uh, as, an, as a form of identity. Um, so uh, Zengi was a, was a, he wasn't that known as a great religious, you know, magnanimous ruler, but he was a great leader of armies. And he lived in a tent as well. And actually, this is where Salah din gets the example. Uh, Zengi's son, Nuruddin, lived in a tent, and Salah din lived in a tent. Um, and they really rose or got legitimacy in the fighting against the Crusaders. So Salah uh, was born in 1232 in the town of Tikrit. Now Tikrit was made kind of infamous in the modern times. It's the birthplace of Saddam Hussein. Um, and his family comes from northern Iraq. His father was a kind of a local official. And, um, and he, his father assisted Zengi when he was retreating from a kind of a defeat. So Zengi owed him favor. And, uh, and then a few years later, uh, this is another important name, Shorkuh, the uncle of Salah din he had a bit of a honor killings in the city, and they were, the whole family was banished from uh, the area. So Zengi took them on, uh, and, uh, and he gave, because of the favor, uh, Salah Adin's father, whose name is Ayyub, and that's where the Salah Adin Ayyub comes from, uh, he made him the commander of the castle of Baalbek. Now Baalbek, uh, Baalbek uh, is the Arabic name, is a very important, very nice town in Lebanon at the in current state. It's known for its uh, uh, cherries at the time. It was known for its cherry production. And even there is a story where uh, the, the caliph in Egypt, uh, at one time, he loved the cherries from Bal Balbek. And the pigeon, the, the courier pigeons, were put one cherry to each leg. 600 of them were sent, and, uh, and, and you know, he had a lot of cherries and you know, 600 times two, so 1,200 and maybe a lot of the people in his court. Um, now, the courier pigeons were a very important form of communication. At the time, it was wide, widely used. I'm just mentioning this because it gives you a, imagine 600 pigeons being sent from a city like Baalbek to uh, Cairo. And the way the Korea pigeons work is that um, you have to raise them, let's say, in Cairo, and then they, are, they, are, they have a home base, and they are transported by land to a city, and then you, you put a message and let them go, and they find their home. So basically, to communicate with Cairo, you have to train thousands of pigeons, send them to all over the place, and then they are sent and continuously circulated. So within a few, uh, uh, half a day, and they could fly, by the way, 100 kilometers an hour. So within half a day, the cherries were in Cairo. Um, and, and Salah had then, by the way, used this very efficiently, the, the courier pigeons, it was because he was ruling a very large uh, empire at the, towards the end of his career. Uh, and intelligence information was extremely important. Um, Salah Din was uh, educated, uh, well educated. He received excellent education, and he was inclined to study of religion, especially hadith. Now, even it is said that when he was uh, later the sultan or the ruler, he continued to study hadith, and one time he reserved three full days to listen to the hadith narration of a famous uh, hadith scholar in Egypt. And then he memorized and repeated that. So he was trying to be qualified hadith scholar. Um, and, and he preferred that rather than joining the military. 
And in fact, he was reluctant at times uh, to go to uh, the battle, especially in his early, early uh, youthful career, when he probably was thinking, OK, what should I become? Um, I mean, there was no uh, obvious path to leadership at that time. He was just a minor, his father was just a minor uh, official in a town. Um, but Nur al-Din, the, the ruler of uh, Syria, took him under his uh, tutelage and really educated him. And uh, Nur al-Din is also an exceptional leader, by the way. And, and you could not have Salah al-Din without Nur al-Din. And uh, Nur al-Din was known as the Wali Sultan, or the saintly king. <coughs> Because one day, uh, they said, there are a lot of stories about him. Uh, one day his wife complained about not having enough income. You know, they, the only income they had was three shops in the city of Homs. And they would bring rent of 20 dinars a year. And when the wife complained, uh, well, that's not enough for us. He, said, he reportedly said, uh, what do you want, woman? You know, uh, uh, the, the money that I have, I am just the gatekeeper. It's Muslims' money. I'm not the owner of this money. I think we need Nur al -Din's in our time, definitely, and uh, especially when some of the rulers in, a, in, a, in Muslim countries think that they own the treasury. And he goes, I cannot betray them by spending that money. And he's also reported to see the Prophet Peace be upon him in his dream one day, one time when he said, save me from these two men. And he showed them in the dream who they were. And, and there was a bit of a conspiracy. Uh, two men were dressed as Muslims and they, were, they traveled to Medina and they were, going to di they were digging a tunnel to the grave of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They were going to uh, exhume his uh, body or, and, and take it away. And uh, that was, uh, they were caught uh, and, uh, and because of the dream of Nur al-Din. And, uh, <clears throat> and the Nur al-Din followed, uh, you know, the fighting amongst Muslims has always been a massive problem, even from the era of the rightly guided caliphs, you know, the tensions there. Uh, so you really needed a, people needed a reason to fight. And, uh, but sometimes you could easily find those reasons. But Nur al-Din, uh, he avoided, for example, the capture of Damascus. Damascus is a very important city. He was based in Aleppo. He actually does this three-year campaign to win the hearts and minds of the people of the city. And in the end, the people of the city kick uh, the ruler uh, away when they find out that he is conspiring uh, with the crusaders against Nur al-Din. And, uh, and so eventually he captured the city without fighting. So this was, uh, uh, Salah al-Din learned from this. This is a very important strategy. Uh, to unite people, you, know, like you cannot unite people when you are victorious and then you punish people and you act in vengeance. It's impossible. Then everyone will think, oh, OK, he can turn against us any time and do the same. So that was a very important learning for Salah al-Din, who would later repeat that kind of soft diplomacy. And, um, and then even when he captured, when he won in battles, uh, he would uh, let people go, give them gifts, and free them away. Uh, one time, the, the um, Saif al-Din, who is the ruler in Mosul, he loses a battle, and uh, when they capture him, his army is full of birds and uh, instruments, you know. The, um, and then he says to him, go to the city, here's your birds, here's your instruments, and have fun. <laughs> and uh, here's some gifts and money to you. Um, <clears throat> so Salah al-Din first rose to prominence when he was the age of 26. Um, when his uncle, uh, when his uncle Shorkuh was given the duty of campaigning in Egypt, and the way this happened was, uh, when uh, the the Grand Vizier of Egypt, Shawar, this is another important, famous name of that era. 
um, were kicked out of his office by another guy. In fact, you know, I think over in 10 years, 11 of the viziers are assassinated in Egypt. But it was just in turmoil, the whole country at that time. And Shawar sort of escapes, comes to Nuruddin in Damascus, says, help me, please help me. I want to, uh, uh, let's go with an army, here's money, and, um, and uh, reinstate me back as the vizier of the city. And the caliph, by the way, at that time was a child caliph. That was one of the reasons. Um, so uh, the army, uh, Nuruddin agrees. He sends Sharkuh with Salah al -Din. And Sharkuh, there's, a, there's all these battles that takes place. Um, and uh, Shawar is instituted back into uh, the, being the wazir. And then Shawar says, OK, land leave. <laughs> Because you have to go now, sorry. And the Shorku says, well, that's not, that's not how we understand the agreement. So we're going to stay. And now Shawar conspires with the Crusaders to come to kick uh, Shorku out of Egypt. And there's uh, uh, a second battle takes place with the Crusaders. Uh, the Shorku wins with the help of Salah ad -Din. Saladin was command in the center of the army at that time. And uh, Saladin then given the command ship of uh, Alexandria after that. And then another crusader army comes. And this time they lay a siege of Alexandria. And in this place, uh, Saladin witnesses the, the hardship of a siege. And he really doesn't want to get involved with these battles again. So they go back to. Damascus, but later again problems happen in Egypt. Shorku is going to come back again, uh, and this time Saladin doesn't want to go. He gives all these excuses. So no, no, no. I, I saw the harm in Alexandria, and then he gives the excuse of you know not having enough uh, funds for his family. But in the end, Nuruddin convinces him. He says that I was led. Um, I had to go like a man led off to his death. That's the kind of uh, impression that he has. <clears throat> but uh, in the end, uh, as around uh, Salah ad uh, gets rid of Shawar. And uh, soon after, his uncle Shorkuh dies. And this is his fortunes. Kind of show, those both two strong men go. So he's left uh, as the only person who is really capable of ruling Egypt. And uh, the caliph, the Fatimid caliph al-Adid declares him the Grand Vizier. Now, look, this is a bit of an issue because if you're the Grand Vizier of a Fatimid ruler, then where does that leave Nuruddin, who is sending them? They are really part of Nuruddin's army. And then Nuruddin has allegiance to the, the caliph in Baghdad. This becomes a tension later on as well uh, in, the, in the future. Um, but sort of Salah then stays in Egypt. Please let me know if my time is up, uh, Suhail. Um, how much to go? Five minutes. OK, for the break? OK. Um, all right. May, uh, so Saladin tries to consolidate his power in Egypt, or settle Egypt, law and order. And uh, soon after, a few months later, there's an attempt to assassinate him by the close courts of the caliph. And then uh, some Sudanese, 50,000 soldiers rebel against him. So it's in great trouble. But he puts down all of these rebellions and escapes the assassination attempt. Um, and on top of that, in 1169, a combined Crusader and Byzantine army attacks Egypt. Because Egypt is a very important country. It's a, it's a source of uh, not only grains, uh, but also access to Indian Ocean. So nobody wants to lose. Uh, uh, Byzantines want to get it back. Crusaders want it. But obviously, Nuruddin and uh, Salahaddin don't want to lose it. 
Uh, so Nuruddin calls his father, his brothers, they all come, settle with him in Egypt. Um, and in the end, he successfully repels all these attacks. And he does something very smart, which wins in popularity amongst the population of Egypt. He reinstates zakat. I mean, zakat was always there, but it was never collected by the state. So he collects it by the state. And he abolishes some unpopular uh, taxes on trade. So basically free trade and also collect zakat, give it to poor people. This makes him very popular amongst the Sunni majority in Egypt. And Saladin said once, the most miserable rulers are those whose purses are fat and their people are thin. <laughs> so um, he basically wanted to give all of that or provide the channel the money that the country had to poor people. Um, but uh, at this, in the meantime, he's also establishing madrasas for about Sunni that uh, train sort of Sunni scholars, uh, slowly replaces the Ismaili officials with Sunni officials. Um, that's why he's a little bit unpopular with the Shiite Muslims, Salah din And in the end, uh, he ends the, uh, the caliph's rule, which was nominal at, by that time, by... Now, uh, at that time, uh, one of the very important aspects of sovereignty of a ruler was that his name was mentioned in Friday khutbahs. You know, when you pray for... Well, at the end of the khutbah, there's a prayer section, so you pray for the Prophet, the Khulafai Rashidin, and then the Sultan, and then the rest of the Muslims. Now, on, on one of the Friday khutbahs at that time, Al-Adid's name was mentioned. He, it's replaced and the, the Caliph in Baghdad, his name is mentioned instead. And uh, at that time, uh, Al-Adid was sick and he dies two days later. And Saladin says, if I knew he was going to die in two days' time, I would have not, uh, I have, I would have delayed it. And his, uh, uh, one of chief advisors said, uh, if he knew you, were, you weren't going to do this, he wouldn't die. <laughs> A kind of saying that uh, he died out of grief, perhaps. Um, and then in the meantime, he sends his uh, brother Turan Shah to capture Yemen. So you can see that his rule is expanding from uh, northern uh, Egypt, southern Egypt, all the way down to Yemen which includes protection of Mecca and, and Medina as well. Uh, so all of this, especially the removal of the uh, Fatimid Caliph, brings Salah ad -Din and Nur ad-Din in a bit of an unspoken tension. On one hand, Nur ad-Din is his mentor. On the other hand, he is now equal, kind of. But at the same time, Salah ad-Din doesn't want to appear as if he's rebelled against his king his ruler. So, uh, I mean, Nur ad-Din sends uh, sort of uh, financial officials to check the, you know, to check the books and things like that, and a certain amount of payment is made. Uh, just to reiterate his point that he's still the overarching ruler in both Egypt and, and Syria. Um, so this sort of goes for about five years. And in the end, Nur ad-Din passes away in 1174 which basically brings Nur uh, Salah ad -Din and a kind of an open check to go into Syria. Um, he's invited to repel Crusaders' attempt against Damascus, and he goes into the city as a, as a hero's welcome, uh, takes over the city, and starts one city after another. He takes control of Syria as well. And uh, now, uh, Ismailis, or the assassins, they had two major centers. One in the Mount Alamut, which is the center of their founder, Hassan al-Sabbah. And that is in the southern Caspian Sea, in northern Iran. And they also had a center in Masyaf, which was kind of like a hilltop castle. And they control about nine other castles in the area. Um, there was, because Saladin ended the Fatimid Caliphate, 
he became a target of the assassins. And those two attempts to assassinate him, one of them came very close. He was actually injured in the, in the attempt. And then he's angry. He goes and lays a siege to Masyaf. But in the end, um, there's, a, there's a deal. We, we still don't know. Historians don't know what was the deal. But apparently, uh, it meant that Saladin did not attack the Israel, uh, Ismaili stronghold on the condition that they would not target Saladin. Actually, later on, uh, the leader of the Ismailis, Sinan, sends even help to Saladin against the Crusades, especially the Third Crusade. So they, were, they came to a bit of a amicable terms. Um, so basically, Saladin spends most of this early life consolidating his rule and power in Egypt and Syria for his ultimate aim, which was to recapture of Jerusalem. And that's what we're going to continue after the break, Michelle.